Before we fire up Photoshop, we have to step back and think about what we are trying to do. Design is more than visuals, it's about allowing the user to do what they need to do and organising our information so our users can find what they need. Jeffrey Zeldman said it best, Design communicates on every level. It tells you where you are, cues you to what you can do and facilitates the doing. So let's think about how our users will be using our app. Let's think about the limitations of devices and let's think about what our users are doing when they are using our app. Limitations sound like a pain, and they can be, but it also gives us a chance to become better designers. When you have limitations, you have to be creative to get around them. If you have a mobile device, have a look at it. How is it different to a regular desktop? Well, for starters, the screen is much smaller in both physical size and the number of pixels. Even the high resolution ones have less pixels than today's standard baseline of 1024 by 768. Most devices are now continually connected to the internet, but the connection is likely to be slower, less reliable, and more expensive. Device manufacturers also impose arbitrary limits on resources in an attempt to ensure a decent user experience. One example is the 10 megabyte limit of images in mobile Safari. If you hit that limit, no more images will load. No warning, no way to error check, they just won't show. But we've been there before. What is definitely different to what we are used to is the input system. Most devices use a touch screen and maybe a keyboard if you're lucky. The accuracy of your finger isn't as good as a mouse and entering words with one or two thumbs on a small keyboard is far slower and less accurate than touch typing. Because of this, Apple recommends a minimum target of 44 pixels square. On a 480 pixel tall screen, that is one tenth of the screen real estate. Factor in white space and other non-interactive widgets, it should be obvious that we can't fit too much stuff on each screen. And what about dev devices without touch screens? Having to select UI elements using a keypad or a scroller is slow and linear, so placement of related information is really important. Regardless, there are certain patterns that work really well for mice. The point is, using things like mouse over or hover doesn't really mean anything. You will, at least in the context of mobile versions of a website, have to find another way to do stuff. Mobile manufacturers have spent a lot of time refining their UIs, so it would be silly for us to just throw all of that away. No. Not only is there a good chance that the design patterns they have used will work nicely, most users are probably already familiar with them. Experience is a powerful UI tool, and while it may not be possible to exactly replicate UI elements, you should still look at what the phone designers have done. Let's have a look at some common design patterns. The carousel is probably the simplest pattern. It's basically a set of cards that you can swipe between. It's a really natural action, and it's a great way to show related data that has no hierarchy. One of the problems with this pattern, though, is you need to be able to fit each piece of information in the set on a single card. Spanning information over multiple cards doesn't work particularly well. The tab bar is a common way to describe a top-level nav. It is generally always visible and allows users to quickly traverse between different areas in the UI. Each tab has a stack of pages users can navigate through. Of course, with the small screen size, the number of tabs you can have is limited. You can extend this a little bit by removing text labels, but then you need to make sure that your icons are really descriptive. Tab bars hold stacks of page pages. If you make those stacks lists, the best you best emulate a traditional site hierarchy. A list uses the master detail pattern. You pick an item from the master view and you get to see the detail view. If you have a lot of structured data, it's a winner. If, but don't go too deep because it makes going back up the list a, a bit of a pain. Okay, so let's do some wireframing. This will help us think about the user how the user interface will work. We should also have a think about what features we can drop what we can triage into different versions, and what features are absolutely required. After that, we can think about colors and finally get our hands dirty. There is a whole lot of different wireframing products out there. We've used OmniGraffle, but you can try Balsamic or I have Mockup. Hey, you could even go old school and use a pencil and paper.
Here is a list of the features that have been requested by the client. Don't take that as gospel though. It's our job to help the client cull this list, both to save time and money, but more importantly to make sure we don't overwhelm the user. It takes a lot of work to make something simple. It's also worthwhile trying to work out who the target audience is. This will influence the language and visual design of the app. If we can't do user testing, you can probably make some educated guesses. It's not optimal, but sometimes that's all we can get. Anyway, for our app, users will probably be female between the ages of 14 and 25 and more than likely located in a celebrity hotspot. After extensive discussions, hair pulling and gnashing of teeth, we've managed to distill our requirements down to what three core features and one that would be really nice if we can get it, but we know it's really hard to do, so we might put it at the bottom of the list. That's the last one. For whatever reason, barely any devices allow you to upload photos from your phone, although we'll see how we can handle that later on. Let's start with a blank template. We'll use an iPhone template here only because there's lots of those floating around. We'll be using a similar design for all the phones we're targeting, so it's a pretty irrelevant which uh, Chrome we use. Add a status bar and a toolbar. This reduces the vi uh, viewable area by about 64 pixels. Looking about at the first of our requirements, we need to find a way to find celebrity appearances. This sounds, sounds like the perfect opportunity to use a list. We'll be able to list all the locations and then a user will be able to drill down to a list of celebrities and then further drill down to view individual celebrities. Oh, that reminds me, we should uh, look at how we can enter locations. The most obvious way would be to get the user to enter an address, suburb, state, postcode and country. But this is way too hard. As we pointed out, entering data in a phone is a bit painful. You've seen damn you autocorrect, right? Technology to the rescue, although that is what got us into trouble in the first place. We can use something like Google Maps to convert addresses to longitude and latitude, so users can just type in the addresses and it will parse it for us. On that note, we should consider the fact that mobile soft keyboards take up a lot of space. Thankfully, they aren't on the screen permanently, but it's a worthwhile thing to think about as it will mask part of the screen. Back to those wireframes. We can mock up the second level of our location stack. This, is, this will show you the list of celebrities. You'll notice that we've added one small piece of information, how many days ago the person was seen. We haven't got room for all of the information, but sometimes some bits are important enough to make it up the stack. Let's think about the global nav or the tab bar. What features will users need to get to quickly? A button to add a sighting has got to be the most important, as that is what provides us with all of our data. Let's put that up front and center. Part of the requirements was to list sightings by location and by celebrity. So let's jazz up the wording a little and use spots and stars. We'll put those in the left and right positions respectively. iOS has an app mode, which allows you to add websites to your home screen. You can even do some little tricks to make the app feel more native. We'll talk about those later on, but it'll be a nice little bonus for the client. So we'll work up a quick little wireframe for that. The only real difference is we'll put the tab bar at the bottom because that's the iPhone way. Also, we can get rid of that footer as it won't show up in app mode. One thing about app mode though, you lose all of the browser chrome. It would look, wouldn't look very app-like if it was sitting inside mobile Safari, would it? We need to add some navigation in for our users, so let's put a back button up in the top left hand corner, which is standard for iOS. Next, we should pick some colours. Let's think about the app. It's about celebrities. What colours are synonymous with the rich and famous? Well, they spend a lot of time at photo ops on red carpets, so a red base colour might work. Also, they are rich. No other com colour conveys that better than gold. Luckily, red and gold go together quite nicely, so we'll use those two colours as a base. As red is a more aggressive colour, we'll use that as a background, so let's pick a lighter and darker shade for contrast. We'll also pick a lighter shade and white to enhance the gold. If we throw our colours on screen, you'll see that they work quite nicely, and by picking a couple of different hues, we've created a natural depth. 
the darker red seems to sit behind the lighter red. But using two alter alternating hues of colour, we can create a zebra stripe effect that helps us group pieces of information together. It also helps break up the display a little. It's a bit flat though. A neat trick is to add a lighter border at the top and darker border at the bottom. This gives us a bevel effect. Now the rows look even more clickable. Finally, to make the device feel even more touchable, although that does sound a bit creepy, we'll add some discrete gradient lighting effects. This helps make the clickable area pop out and look more like a button. Notice that we've made the Add a Sighting button white. By adding this contrast in colour, we're able to identify it much quicker than its neighbouring grey buttons. Looks pretty slick, eh? Oh, one very important piece of information left. The app icon. It should be, well, iconic. And what says star more than a star? Anyway, let's steal the colour scheme. Gold star. This stuff just writes itself. And bang, we have a visual treatment for the app. So next up, let's get our code on and make this thing into a real app.